Welcome to episode two of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show and the president of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. On today's show, we have Mr. Glenn Stafford, a martial artist from Vermont, now calling Tennessee his home. I've known Mr. Stafford for years, as his instructor is my instructor's son. He's a good guy and a good friend. He also suffered a major setback in life and in his training just a few months ago. We talk about that in detail and how his martial arts training has helped him overcome this challenge. You won't want to miss this episode. Mr. Stafford, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you very much. Nice being here. Well, um, why don't you give us, me, the listeners, a little bit of your history with martial arts. How did you get started? Who with? Where? When? All those fun semantic details. Okay, well, um, I guess it all began when I was a child and I actually saw some of the martial arts films. I was always interested in taking the martial arts, but my school was so small that I couldn't do that. Uh, When I went to college, I ended up hanging out with this guy who seemed to be the most popular guy in school. So I kind of followed him around and hung on his shirt tails a little bit, hoping some of that popularity would rub off on me. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, that was uh, who is now Master Lenny Jordan. And uh, he was training under who is now Grandmaster Dunleavy. So I spent four years in college training with Master Dunleavy. Once I graduated from college, I, I graduated with a high red belt. And, and this is in Taekwondo? Uh, in Taekwondo, in Johnson, Vermont, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was training with Grandmaster Dunleavy in Morrisville, Vermont. And once I graduated from college, I ended up moving down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I spent about 20 years down there before I moved back to Vermont in 2008. Now, the 20 years that I was down in Fort Lauderdale, I looked – at other possibilities for martial arts. I looked at other styles, kickboxing, tang sudo. Uh, I looked at other taekwondo schools. And the quality that I was experiencing down in Fort Lauderdale was not the same as what I had experienced with Grandmaster Dunleavy and Master Jordan in Vermont. So I was very, very, very drawn back to them when I moved back to Vermont. Okay, so you moved you move down there, and when was this? I moved down to Fort Lauderdale in 1988, and I moved back to Vermont in 2008. Okay, so 20 years. So for 20 years, you're kind of – sounds like carrying a torch for martial arts. You're missing it. Keep trying to find a place that, that you can call home, but missing this original school and these people that you started training with. In college, yes, I was very much missing the, very much trying to find a filler for that part of me that was missing. Yes. Okay, so you moved back to Vermont, and I'm going to guess it didn't take you long to start training with these people again. No, it didn't take long at all. I probably was training probably within weeks, maybe wow. two or three weeks. I was went back to training, and uh, I think probably. In 2012, I received my black belt from both uh, Grandmaster Dunleavy and Master Jordan. Okay. So, sounds like that's probably a bit of a, a checkbox on your on your bucket list. Oh, not that you might have had. It wasn't just a bucket list. I mean, it was at that point in time a very big part of who I became. And thank goodness, because if I had not spent the time doing the martial arts and and training like I was training, I might not might not be here today. Okay, so what do you, tell us what you mean by that? Well, I was supposed to. I was given the okay to test for my second degree black belt in December of 2014. So but, that's you know for for listeners that might be. Hearing this, you know, a couple years from now, that that's only, you know, it was four months ago. Yeah, only only four months ago, and um, I had a little setback. I ended up suffering a stroke on December tenth of two thousand fourteen. Okay, so again, that that wasn't that long ago. No. And 
you're you don't fit the typical mold that that I might think of as a stroke victim. So, uh, how old are you? I am currently now 45 years of age. I just okay. just had a birthday a couple weeks ago. So okay. So I had a stroke at the age of 44. And I mean, I'm not wrong in in thinking that, right? It's not common for a 44 year old to have a stroke. No, not common at all. Um, okay. Typically, you would relate that to somebody who was not in good shape, somebody who'd smoke, somebody who had a lot of health disorders, health uh, disabilities, um, somebody who was older in general. You know, you you don't usually have a stroke at 44. Okay. So here you are. You're, you're 44. You're in good shape. You're not smoking. You don't fit any of these these typical factors that might throw someone towards a stroke. So what happened? Well, I'm not very good with pronouncing the medical term, but uh, they're saying it was a vertebral dissection in one of my arteries going to my brain, something that actually happened in the, my neck area. They think it, it might have been um, some sort of trauma to my neck. They're not really sure. They don't have any one specific idea. They just kind of narrowed it down to something that might have been uh, some sort of, you know, trauma to my neck that caused a um, a tear in my artery. And when that tear healed itself, it created a blood clot. So that's uh, supposedly what they think happened. But I don't have anything, no, no uh, medical history, no, uh, no health related issues. I don't have, uh, I'm not a, a smoker. I'm not overweight. You know, I train 10, 10 hours a week in Taekwondo. You know, I was getting ready for my second degree black belt at that time. So, so did, did your martial arts background play any part in your recovery? Uh, everybody seems to think so. Uh, I have, you know, in the, the four months that I've, I've suffered the stroke, I went from having weak side on my left to gaining some of the mobility back. Uh, I had some speech problems where my mouth was a little droopy so that uh, some of my verbiage was slurred. And because I was in the shape that I was in, because I had the perseverance and the discipline, I was definitely, uh, I was definitely better off. Okay, so let, let's go back a little bit because I, I think you're you're being a little humble with this. After your after your stroke, and, and I, I think this is important for people to hear. After your stroke, you said you had some weakness in your left side. Can you be a little more specific? How, what what were you able and not able to do? Um, at one point in time. Uh, immediately after my stroke, I would say probably a week after the stroke, um, I could not move my left side at all. Not my left arm, not my left hand, not the fingers on my left hand. I couldn't walk. I couldn't move my left foot up and down. I couldn't move my toes at all. Couldn't wiggle them. I was. Okay, so it might not be the best medical way to express it, but to, to someone like, like me outside the medical field, I might say that you were half paralyzed. I absolutely was, yes. Okay. Okay. So four months ago, you're in bed, you're you're can't use the left side of your body. Yeah, I was uh um I was at the University of Vermont Medical Center for a week. Then I was released and I was transferred over to the rehab facility at Fanny Allen in uh in Vermont. And that's where I was able to work on rehabbing and getting my my strength back on my left side. So at this point in time, four months after my stroke, I am living in Tennessee and I am walking around by myself. I don't use a crutch. I don't use uh, a brace. I don't use a wheelchair. Um, I'm even able to, you know, make some of my own meals and cook. And, you know, I'm I'm I'm. You know, I'm probably about 
fifty percent of what I used to be. Okay. And I mean, you we were even talking in the the pre-show that you even played a little bit behind the wheel of a car. Yes, I've actually uh, I've practiced driving a little bit. I haven't been cleared to drive yet, but I have been able to get behind the wheel and drive around parking lot and. Thank, sure, thank, sure, thank so. goodness I didn't run into any trees or anything like that. So that's that's pretty good news. So no no listeners in, in Tennessee have to worry that, that you might be coming out of an intersection to Tebow them anytime soon. But I think that illustrates pretty well how fast you've made progress. Is are there you know, are there statistics on this? Can we say I mean I, I think it's pretty clear to me and probably to everyone listening that you've recovered faster than than most people would are there numbers to back that up i don't have any specifics i only have you know general statements made by those people who are uh, medically trained and are aware of my case but I, what are they saying i am probably in the top one percent okay so that's hey if, if you're going to be in the top one percent for something this is the thing to be in Right. Uh, what what do you chalk that up to? Would you say that's martial arts? Would you say it's um, lust for life, stubbornness? Um, probably all of the above. Okay. I would have to say all of the above. Um, you know, I've always been the type of guy that uh, when I went to uh, to class. If you wanted me to give you 10 push-ups, I gave you 11. You know, I've got that kind of perseverance and that kind of tenacity, that kind of uh, desire to do above and beyond when I, wherever I could. Sure. So. And so let's let's kind of finish up that line about re- recovery and and martial arts, and we can talk about a couple other things. We, have you? Have you started training at all? No, I am currently registered at a fitness facility, and even this week, I'm supposed to be giving a um, uh, release order by my my primary care physician to go ahead and work out. I have uh, I have started doing very light weights and some spin classes and some swimming. Mm-hmm. You know, when I say swimming, you know, I was just standing around waving my arms around. So it's not like I was, you know, competing with Michael Phelps or anything like that. But, <laughs> okay. You know. All right. Um, how bad do you miss it? Every day. Yeah. Yeah, I miss it every day. You know, I can find myself in a seated position and I'll actually – try and move my left arm as I would if I was doing a low block or a high block in Kibon one for Taekwondo, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the patterns I would actually just go through the motions and, you know, at least give it a try. And, and you're still doing that. How's that going? Um, just, just fighting every day. You know, uh, the doctor actually told me that, Six about six months from the stroke, I should be able to do Taekwondo again. And so that's that's pretty soon. And every medical professional I've spoken to says that my recovery should be one hundred percent by the time I get done. It might be a year and a half, two years, but I should be able to become one hundred percent once again. So then I will go ahead and do all the training I can to form my second degree black belt. I, I, you know, and listening to you, I have, I have no doubt that you're going to make a full recovery and that you're going to go on to that second degree black belt and third degree black belt and however far that you want to take it. Um, I've known stroke victims before and they're all, of course, they've all been older, but not a one of them has had the refusal to give up. They've pretty much accepted their position and rather than committing to getting better, they've committed to adapting to their new body. And I think that's an important difference for people to to hear. And I think the 
foundation you have, the, the brain body connection that you have from your experience with martial arts and having something that you love so much that it's, it sucks that you can't do it right now. And I think it's driving you. And I think that that's really awesome to hear. And I hope people get that. So let's switch gears for a little bit. Uh, you spoke pretty fondly, it sounded like, of the the two people that brought you up in martial arts. Can you tell us a little bit about them and your relationship with them? Well, um, let's see here. As I bring it up, it might uh, might uh, bring a tear to my eye. It might choke me up a little bit, but uh, I think I can do it. We're, we're okay with that if you are. Well, I'd have to say probably um, the, the time that I spent at Johnson State College with Master Jordan, he and I became probably, best description, best friends. And I still hold on to that relationship today. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, uh, I would probably say that at my time in college, that even though I did have a father, Grandmaster Dunleavy was probably like a father to me. So yeah, I'd have to say that uh, those two individuals probably have created who I am today. And of course, if if listeners haven't figured figured this out yet, um, you. You and I are not strangers. I've known you for for several years now, and and of course I know Master Jordan and Grandmaster Dunleavy, and they are pretty exceptional people. That doesn't change the fact that I'm still strange. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, you you are strange. You are you are a strange friend, but uh, a friend nonetheless. Well, I how about cop? I have to agree with that. Yeah. How about competition? Have you ever participated in any competition, martial arts competition? Actually, quite often, yes. Um, I can tell you that uh, one of the things that stick with me today is uh, my very first martial arts competition. I went uh, under the guidance of Grandmaster Dunleavy, who was still Master Dunleavy at that point in time. I competed in a tournament as a white belt. And uh, I was a white belt at the the age of 18, and I went up against a white belt who had been practicing as a white belt for quite some time, and he was probably 30 years my senior, and he gave me a whooping. And this was with with forms competition or sparring. Uh, actually, or? this is this was a sparring competition. He actually took me to school, so I spent a lot of time training and trying to get better after that. And uh, I've done pretty well. Actually, when I went back down when I went down to Florida, I c- competed in in a uh, tournament. And even though I had only been with the school for about a month, I took the whole tournament at uh, my rank of high red belt. And uh, I can honestly say that uh, it was due to what I'd learned from Master Jordan and Grandmaster Dunleavy that I was able to do so because after being with a month with a new instructor, I didn't learn anything new, didn't have very much experience at all with the whole Florida setting. And I just took what I learned from uh, Grandmaster Dunleavy and Master Jordan and took that to the tournament and took the tournament. So Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was the guidance of Grandmaster Dunleavy that uh, was able to assist me in getting a second. I got a silver medal in uh, Vermont State uh, full contact tournament and somewhere around uh, 89 or 91, I think. Okay. Wow. So if you could train, this is kind of a stereotypical question, but of course we put our martial arts spin on it. If you could train with any martial artist, living or dead, who would it be and why? 
Well, of course, you have to throw it out there as probably um, uh, Bruce Lee, you know, sure. being the iconic martial artist that he is. If I was to have a second place, it would probably be Chuck Norris. I mean, I know those are probably two stereotypical martial artists, but I think those are two that are the most authentic for their art. I think they're the, the two that are the most dedicated. So those would be the, the top two that I would have. Sure. Did Did you grow up watching the, either or both of them in movies or TV? Uh, still do today. Still see all the rewinds, see all the, the repeats. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Are you a Walker, Texas Ranger fan? Um, I'm a fan of the man and the concept. I can't <laughs> say the character is all that fantastic. You know, the acting is not Chuck Norris's number one calling. I I think I'd have to agree with you, unless he was within kicking distance, and then, then I would disagree with you. Well, I think at that point in time, we get away from the acting. I think we get back to his true calling. Right. Do you have a favorite martial arts film? Um, I tell you, I I know so many. I can't say that I have a favorite of just one. Um, Throw a couple at us. Uh, probably I'd have to go with the classics. Probably the Game of Death and the Octagon. Mm-hmm. Those two are are pretty high up on my list. I think. Um, of course, being a Taekwondo uh, practitioner, best of the best was always a good film. Yep. No, I would not give much credit to Best of the Best 2, 3, or 4. <laughs> <laughs> I think rumor has it they even made a fifth one, but I didn't see that either. I I think I stopped watching it too. Yeah. yeah well, you, you, maybe, you maybe I, I can, favor then. Maybe I'll, I'll skip 3 and 4. I'll go try and find 5 because that if if you haven't seen it, if you're not even sure it exists, it's probably not that good. And I, I love a, a good, bad martial arts film. Those are fun. Well, then you should definitely see uh, Best of the Best 4 because okay. because that was a bad film. <laughs> that's where that's where a traditional martial artist is given a gun. <laughs> oh. It was pretty bad. That that sounds like a interesting concept for a martial arts flick. Yeah, it sure was. Uh, how about any books? Any martial arts Books that have spoken to you or, or had an impact on you over the years? Um, books. Well, I have to be ashamed to say that I am not a huge book reader. Um, I think my martial arts books have probably ended with Black Belt Magazine and uh, probably a novel called The Ninja. Okay. Well, I mean – not going to scold you for reading Black Belt magazine. We're pretty heavy supporters of Black Belt and have advertised in there for quite a while now. Uh, one book you might want to check out then that's on the smaller side and, and kind of an easy read. In fact, growing up, it was in the bathroom at my house is Zen in the martial arts. Uh, really short, you know, one to three page kind of parables that you can get through in a short time frame. Well, then I'll have to put that on the top of my Amazon list right there. So as we wind down, any martial arts-related goals for the future? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming uh, the first one might be getting healthy and starting to train again, but how about beyond that? Well, I have to say that something I've had as a goal for a long time is to actually reach that fourth-degree black belt rank of master. Uh, I've been doing martial arts now for 30 years, and uh, to actually attain that goal and that rank of master would probably be the number one on my list. It's a good goal. I I would. I look forward to calling you Master Stafford at some point. I can say that for certain. Well, thank you, sir. Well, um. Anything else you want to share? No, I think that's uh, that's a pretty good. Uh... I, I th- yeah, I thought, think we dug into it pretty well, and um, hopefully, in 
in a little bit as you're starting to train again. Love to have you back on and we can talk about the your your personal journey through this recovery. I think it's it's really compelling and um I know if I want to hear it there are other people out there that want to hear it. So so thank you. Uh are there you know, if people want to reach you, is there a way we can reach you that you're willing to share? Um if uh if anybody wants to reach out to me, I guess uh you know, uh, go ahead and hit me up on uh my email address, which is Glenn S V T one at gmail dot com. I'm not opposed to receiving fan mail or uh spam mail. I'm pretty good at erasing that pretty quick. Well, hopefully we'll you'll end up with some fans, maybe there even be some people out there that have been through this and can offer you some more, some more words of encouragement. Um, doesn't sound like you need them though. You're, you're doing a great job. And of course we'll throw that email address and, and all the other th- things that we talked about. Maybe I can even find a link to the IMDB page for best of the best four and throw that in the show notes for everyone. That'd be pretty funny. So, well, cool. Uh, Mr. Stafford, really appreciate you having you on to uh, talk to everybody. It's totally my pleasure. All right. And thanks a lot for, appearing on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Yeah, it was great being here. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to Mr. Glenn Stafford for coming on and talking to me. You can check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you'd like to learn more about what we offer at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, check us out at whistlekick.com. Have a great day.